Um, Simon T. Bailey is the Chief Executive Officer of Simon Bailey International. Success Magazine calls Simon Bailey one of the top 25 people who will help you reach your business and life goals in 2018. His goal cast video released on Facebook on Father's Day 2018, get this, has over 57 million views. Simon is the author of nine books, with number 10 coming out this fall. A breakthrough strategist, Simon is an expert on leadership, change management, and customer experience, and diversity and inclusion. Let's give an Omaha welcome back to the city to Simon Bailey. Good morning, how are you? Do me a favor, look at the person that you're sitting next to, look him in the eye, look him in the eye, and tell him since the last time I've seen you, you look marvelous, simply marvelous. <laughs> no, I want to tell you, I want to tell you that perhaps this Monday morning is my first rodeo. So if you like this presentation, I've gotten a lot of coaching in the last 30 minutes from Erica, Pete, and Valerie. So uh, you can thank them afterward for how I perform, okay? But I'm really happy to be here. And what I'm gonna do in the next few moments that we have together, I'm gonna share with you three principles around this whole thing of diversity and inclusion. I'm gonna also talk about the business case for diversity and inclusion. I wanna share with you some evidence-based research that's out there on the horizon. And then I wanna give you some uh, real-time examples of what some corporations are doing. And then finally, I wanna end with some uh, specific things on how you really embed diversity and inclusion inside a culture, okay? So a little bit of my backstory. Uh, I have 30 years of experience in the hospitality industry. I worked for six different companies, 10 different jobs, and my last job was sales director and new best business development director for the Disney Institute, AKA the happiest place in the world. So, when I went to work for Disney, I had left an organization of about 100 people to now join an organization of 64,000 people working within 47 square miles at the Walt Disney World Resort. And uh, there's over 2,000 job titles, and I was overwhelmed, uh, let alone just not being an African-American male, but I was trying to figure out how do I get anything done in the seventh most recognized brand in the world. And I had made a decision that when I hit the 90-day mark that I was going to quit Disney and I was, I was going to leave Disney. And about day 89, just through serendipity, I got a call from Janice Petrie, who was the recruiter that had recruited me to come and work at Disney. It took me two years to get hired at Disney, 10 interviews, and a 10-page psychological analysis from the Gallup organization. And I think they said, this guy's not going away, so let's just give him a job. So uh, <laughs> in the South, they would say, bless his heart, you know? So, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> they eventually hired me, and Janice says to me, she said, how's it going? I'm like, Janice, I can't get anything done. I'm out of here. I'm quitting. She says, no, no, no. She said, everything you need to know to succeed in the Disney culture is not written in the employee handbook. I was like, duh. So she said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna connect you with two senior vice presidents who you need to meet. And I said, okay, I'll meet them. One gentleman uh, was a, a guy by the name of Jim Lewis, who was the senior vice president who reported directly to the president, Al Weiss. And another guy um, named Brad Rex, Brad Harvard MBA, uh, US Naval grad. And I would meet with them, and what would have only been 90 days turned into seven years. And what they helped me understand is that whenever you recruit a person from a different ethnic group into an organization, they need a support system. They need a buddy system. They need to be able to talk to someone who understands the dynamics, the rules of engagement, the unwritten rules on how things get Done. So as we talk about racial uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, what I am hearing all across the country, especially from uh, ethnic uh, men and women who go to work for a company, they're like, the reason we don't stay is because if we raise our hand and say we don't know what we don't know or we don't understand the culture, we don't want to be perceived as the odd person out, even though we have the academic ability and the experience to be there, we don't stay because we don't have a sense of belonging.
So one of the things that I'm encouraging organizations to really, really think about is creating a sense of belonging as you begin to recruit uh, minorities into the organization. And that means pairing them up with someone who does not necessarily look like them, that becomes their buddy, that helps them understand that this culture wants them to succeed and they just need to understand how to do it, okay? So with that said, I wanna build on this and um, when you look at this particular statement, I have a question for all of you. How many of you uh, in your organizations want more innovation? How, how many people want innovation? Okay, and innovation as I define it is the intersection of insight and information. But hear me clearly, ladies and gentlemen. Innovation comes from men and women that have a different perspective. Innovation comes from men and women who come from a different ethnicity and they have a different experience. So if we want innovation, do we have a diversity of thought that has a diverse perspective, that has diverse experiences that come from a different group? And when we have that diversity of thought, newsflash, we get the innovation. So if we really, really, really want innovation, I'm really challenging organizations and individuals to think about how often are we looking at that diversity of thought, okay? So with that said, I want to share our first principle around this whole thing of how do we begin to accelerate thinking along this path. And I want you to consider some of this research from McKinsey that was just released this year. And so McKinsey is saying, after studying 1,000 companies in 12 countries, here's what they found when it comes to gender diversity and exe executive leadership, all right, and what they do, profitability. And when you look at the second bullet, in the top 25% for ethnic culture diversity, we're more likely to achieve above average profitability, all right, when you look at their teams and their boards, and when there is not diversity, here's how it impacts them, okay? So when you look at this, McKinsey has taken the deep dive to really understand, is diversity and inclusion just like wah, 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 or is there really a bottom line impact that really happens in organizations, okay? Now, let's build on that a little bit more. In the United States, that relationship between racial ethnic diversity and better financial performance, you see the results, right? And then racial ethnic diversity have a stronger impact on financial uh, performance in the United States than gender diversity. So this ability where men and women come from different ethnic groups, not just the gender diversity, different ethnic groups bringing their experience, their perspectives, their ideas, their ways on how they see the world to the table and it's embraced, all right? So then the question is like, okay, Simon, that's great. How do we get there? So this word is the opposite of what? Deja vu. Deja vu means been there, done that. But vuja day is going there, doing that. So let me just take us through a quick vuja day exercise. I need everybody to hold up your arm where your watch is. Watch, watch a piece of jewelry. And please, ma'am, please, sir, take your watch or piece of jewelry off and put it on the opposite wrist. Put it on the opposite wrist, all right? Now, if you don't have a watch or piece of jewelry, borrow something from your neighbor and tell them I'll give it to you at the next Empowerment Network event. <laughs> you may find your stuff on eBay, all right? <laughs> now, how does it feel having the watch or piece of jewelry on the opposite wrist? How does it feel? Awkward. Weird, why are we doing this cheesy exercise on a Monday morning? Okay, let me ask y'all a question. What time is it? What time is it? All right, now that's a trick question. The most popular question at Disney is what time is the three o'clock parade? That'll hit some of you later on. I know we're moving quick, all right? Here's what I want us to do. If we're gonna accelerate thinking, I wanna invite you, please ma'am, please sir, to leave the watch on the opposite wrist, all right? I know the blood is draining off some of your faces right now. Some of you are looking at me like a deer staring at headlights, I get it. I want you to leave the watch on the opposite wrist because it's gonna serve as a reminder that if we are to vuja day, where we're going and how we do what we do, the watch on the opposite wrist is to serve as a reminder that we're being invited to change because we've always done it this way. And what I discover in organizations, they have emotional equity in how they've done it 
and they don't want to change. But the, uh, there's a, a Yiddish proverb that says the only person that likes change is a wet baby, all right? So in other words, change is a good thing. Change is our friend, not our foe. Change is a brilliant opportunity to grow, all right? I have a cerebral question for you. So how many of you, by show of hands, can see the candle in the slide? Can see the candle in the slide? Very good, very good. How many of you, by show of hands, can see the third face? Can see the third face? If you're sitting next to someone and they have their hand up, ask them, oh brilliant one, show me the third face. Everybody's got to see the third face. Show me the third face. Everybody see it? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so here's the question. How many of you realize the moment I put the slide up, you saw the candle right away, right? But how many realize that the third face was always there? When we put this into a context of diversity and inclusion, the candle is what we've always seen. That's the way it's always, it's always been that way. But the third face is the opportunity that we have to grow market share, to extend our products and services to customers, and to bring a diverse perspective into how we do what we do. So in order to vujade, watch on the opposite risk, is to serve as a reminder, how do I look for the third face? Because the third face is the missing opportunity. It's the question that we don't ask, all right? Let me, let me give you a quick mental bumper sticker. The quality of your questions determine the quality of your thinking. The quality of your questions determine the quality of your answers. The moment you ask a question, it immerses you on a quest to discover an answer that was waiting to emerge. So when we say, how do we vujade salmon swimming upstream, doing things differently, watch on the opposite risk, it's understanding where's that third face, where's that hidden opportunity, okay? So let me tell you a little story about Medtronic, based out of Minneapolis. Within the last year, Medtronic has created something called their diversity empowerment circles. And what they do is they bring men and women from all over the world uh, where they work for Medtronic and they have to work on specific problems that need an innovative breakthrough and strategy. These diversity circles, they will work on a problem, uh, and they'll do it obviously virtually, and then they'll come together, and they actually have to pitch the solution to the problem in front of a group of executives. Once these executives hear these presentations from these diversity empowerment councils, if they think the idea has merit, they actually get that idea funded. And so think of it almost being like an internal shark tank within Medtronic, but they've had many ideas that have been funded to solve problems as the diversity empowerment councils have worked on them together, but that's not the real reason why Medtronic does the, the diversity empowerment circles. The real reason is they want men and women to take back the learning of working on these diversity empowerment councils back to their department, back to their division, and begin to embed that thinking of asking questions, challenging popular opinion, looking for a solution that's not obvious. They want men and women no matter what their title is, to take that thinking and embed it back in their department and become a champion of innovation. So if they're gonna accelerate thinking, they recognize that what got them here won't get them there, and they've gotta th do things differently, okay? Now, Starbucks, um, how many realize that on May 29th, when Starbucks closed its stores uh, that particular afternoon, that Starbucks lost about $12 million. But in Starbucks' mind, they didn't lose anything, they just made a $12 million investment in developing their staff as it relates to racial bias training. And as you know, what led them to do that is what happened in Philadelphia with the two men who were sitting in a Starbucks restaurant, minding their business, just meeting and talking. They didn't necessarily buy anything, but the person behind the counter at Starbucks called the police and had them arrested.
And the two men did not file charges against Starbucks, but Starbucks felt that it had to do something um, because this was yet another black eye against them, all right? But let me tell you how quickly Starbucks has moved, not only in doing that training, because sometimes uh, training can be perceived as a one-off, right? So Starbucks decided that they need to continue to develop the cultures within their organization uh, through racial training and bias training, but they took it a step further. In this past July, they decided to open a store in Washington, D.C., which is the first Starbucks store that is an all-signing store. So they have employees who are deaf or hard of hearing who actually work at the Starbucks store. So if you're ever in DC, it's the, only the second one that they've opened up in the world. The first one is in Malaysia. So this is the first time they're doing it here in the United States because they are saying that we just don't wanna make a commitment to say that we're diverse and we're inclusive. We actually wanna put feet on the ground and actually do it. So Starbucks has ongoing learning and development as it relates to how do we create a culture where everybody belongs, everyone matters, everyone believes that they have something to contribute to the organization, okay? MasterCard. MasterCard has uh, done something very interesting. Two things that I'm really proud of MasterCard for doing. They actually have what they call a re-engagement into the workforce program for women who have been out of the workforce for over a year and now want to get back into the workforce. So what they specifically do is they create a buddy system with women coming back into the workforce and that buddy system gets them up to speed on what is happening in MasterCard MasterCard, what has changed in MasterCard, and uh, how they can take their best skill set and apply it to MasterCard. That's one of the things that they do. But the other thing that MasterCard does is they do reverse mentoring. And reverse mentoring is to take the millennial generation and train the Xers and the Boomers on technology and where it's going. And that reverse mentoring allows MasterCard as a culture globally to stay on the cutting edge. So they're accelerating thinking, and I just share those with you very quickly as examples to think about what does it look like real time, okay? Now, some more, some more uh, feedback for you around the business case for diversity and inclusion. When you look at this one, it says teams are 158% more likely to understand target consumers when they have at least one member who represents their target gender, race, age, sexual orientation, or culture. So having somebody that has that different perspective, third face, ladies and gentlemen, watch on the opposite risk. So whenever you're coming out into the marketplace with something, everybody said, wait a minute, time out. Have we thought about this, okay? Teams that include different point of views or, or thinking styles solve problems faster. Quick little story. When I first got promoted into a leadership role at Disney, I got my corporate American Express card, my name on the door, and I thought I was hot stuff. But I didn't want people to know that I didn't know what the heck I was doing, so I pretended like I knew. <laughs> so how it was proven that I had some areas of opportunity. I went through 360 degree feedback where my peer leaders and direct reports rated me on my performance. If 5.0 was the highest, 1.0 was the lowest, the threshold for leaders at Disney had to be at 4.0 or higher. I came in at 3.5, 3.0 on many of the categories, many of the questions. And so uh, my boss called me into the office, Timothy, and it was not a very pixie dusted conversation. Timothy, raise your hand so people know who you are. This is Timothy, I didn't want y'all to think I was talking to my imaginary friend. Okay, <laughs> I know somebody else said, who's Timothy? I don't know Timothy. Does he root for Nebraska? Who does he root for? Okay, anyway. <laughs> so my boss calls him in the office and he said, walk me through a typical day when you come in the office. I'm like, well, I come in the office, I read my email, I return my calls, and then I'm off to a meeting. He says, do you ever stop to take time to engage the cast members at Disney? Employees are called cast members to engage them in dialogue. I said, dude, I'm from Buffalo, New York. I don't care what they did this weekend. I don't care what the name of the dog, the cat, the niece, the nephew, the son, the daughter. You got the email, you got the memo. Go forth and create magic. That was my attitude. But that's what 
I told him my real problem was I was the first African-American sales director promoted um, in the Disney Corporation. And everybody that was on my team was Caucasian, and I didn't want them to know that I was afraid or fearful of making a mistake because I said, oh Lord, all my ancestors that have gone before me, they are looking down from heaven saying, son, don't you mess up. We marched in the civil rights so you could have this job. So you keep your mouth shut and act like you know what you're doing. <laughs> And that was my mindset. And the reality is, the reality is I shut down and I didn't open up. And when I started to open up, everybody that was white on my team said, we wanted you to succeed, but you didn't talk to us. And so there was this arm's length relationship that you were using us to move on in your career. And I was like, shut the front door, really? And they were right. And what I realized I had to overcome and build a bridge from where they were to where we needed to go as a team. So what I understood is we have to move from me to we. And when we start to talk to each other instead of at each other, then we have diverse perspectives because I was running at best an adult daycare center. And as a leader running an adult daycare center, you don't get innovation because you have a need to be right. You have a need to have all the answers and everybody has to come to Papa to understand what do they say. And it was probably one of my greatest failures uh, while I was there at Disney and I recognized if I didn't change as a leader, Disney was gonna invite me to find my happiness elsewhere, right? So, <laughs> so here's the deal, here's the deal. And this sums this up. The more psychologically safe employees feel at work, the more likely they are to feel included in their work groups. I was not providing a psychologically safe environment because I didn't feel I was psychologically safe, so I was playing small, hiding behind a title instead of engaging the brilliance that was all around me, okay? Now, how do we now begin to amplify your voice as you think about diversity and inclusion? So here's just some quick, some quick thoughts. Make a visible commitment to DNI throughout the organization. And this is not just creating a website that has diverse people and we say we're diverse. Really, 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 that's not special, all right? That's a nice start, but it's not special. There has to be that ongoing conversation, that ongoing dialogue that goes beyond lunch and learn and in February, Black History Month, and in May, it's Cinco de Mayo, and now we gotta go beyond that. And we've gotta talk about it as it relates to dollars and cents. Diversity and inclusion is not black or white, it's green. Hello, somebody. So how do we begin to teach people financial intelligence on how the organization, how the business makes money or makes a difference in the community by having a diverse perspective, all right? How do we expand our network? Think about people with the right expertise instead of those with experience. I was just invited by Sony Electronics Corporation. Sony North America's headquarters is in San Diego. And they decided to bring in one of the top recruiting agencies that recruits for them uh, in San Diego. We got into a really, really robust dialogue. And the recruiting agency said to me, hey, Simon, we are looking to recruit diverse candidates. And Sony says, we absolutely want diverse candidates. But what happens, now the recruiting agency didn't say this, but what happens when the recruiter says, I can't find any diverse candidates. Hmm, really? So, where are you looking? Who are you partnering with? Have you ever heard of the National Society of Black Engineers? Newsflash, right? Because this whole answer of I can't find anyone, it's you're not looking hard enough. All right, and I'm talking going beyond Google and looking at your sphere of influence. If everybody in your sphere of influence looks like you, your circle is too small. So how do we begin to reach up, reach out and ask questions, all right? And then, who are the men and women on your bench? What I'm telling leaders right now all over the world is when you come from 
an abundant mindset. Uh, Dr. Carol Dweck, who is a scholar at Samford University, had a chance to share the stage with Dr. Dweck. She's a 40-year scholar at Stanford, and 40 years of her research has been around this whole concept of mindset. If you haven't read her book, highly recommend it, great read. Here's the central thesis of her book. There's a fixed mindset and there's a growth mindset. The fixed mindset says this is the way it will always be. The growth mindset says how can we make it better? So when you think of a position in a company, how often do we think of a diverse candidate for that position and automatically think of a man or woman that doesn't necessarily look like us ethnic-wise that we can tee up? How many times uh, do we sponsor men and women in an organization to help them advance in their career. I am here today at 50 years of age, having worked with almost 1,700 organizations in 46 countries since leaving the Mouse House because someone who didn't look like me sponsored me. I have many sponsors, and those sponsors believed in me. Now, I had to do the work. Hello, somebody. You know, you, you got to do the work. But how often are we talking about sponsorship? One more example. I was just on the phone with the folks at LinkedIn Learning. LinkedIn Learning, uh, which is formerly lynda.com, and Microsoft bought LinkedIn for $26 billion two Decembers ago. And they said, we want you to create a course that they can put on LinkedIn Learning called How to Find a Sponsor. And so I'm gonna tell the story of how, uh, if there are 150 million people in the United States that are in the working profession right now, so last US Census says 310 million people in the United States, 150, of, 150 million are working, 75 million of the 150 million are millennials. So how do we begin to help them think about moving from finding a mentor to finding a sponsor? And what I'm saying as it relates to diversity and inclusion, I think sponsorship is critically important. All right, so how many of you have heard of Pivotal Ventures out of curiosity? All right, Pivotal Ventures is something that has been launched by Melinda Gates because what she discovered is the investment in products for women and minorities is lacking. So her VC company has decided to only invest in women and minority ventures to help them create products for women and minorities. And it's something that has really taken Silicon Valley uh, by storm because it's Melinda Gates. So as you know, the Gates Foundation is doing amazing things, okay? So uh, something else I want to share uh, about Microsoft, and I found this on a blog that I just really love, is they believe that learning from different people and methods allows them to develop better products, bridge gaps, create connections between cultures, classes, and generations. They actually have in, uh, created an inclusive design kit. So what Microsoft is saying, whenever you think of DNI, Microsoft wants to be seen as a company that provides, here's how they do it don't necessarily have to copy it, but they said here's their blueprint, all right? So third idea is how do we now activate knowledge? Let me talk about Bank of America. Bank of America is a part of the billion dollar group, not just billion dollars as it relates to Fortune 500 company, but when it comes to supplier diversity, they invest over $1 billion to tier one diversity suppliers on an annual basis. But Bank of America doesn't stop there. With their tier one and tier two suppliers that are diverse, they have ongoing educational programs throughout the year where they expose them to executive MBA types of classes, so like a mini MBA or a mini series, where they can help these suppliers grow their business and expose them to real-time research, data, and information. Now, another company that does this, Toyota brought me in a couple years ago to do some work with them, and they too invest in their tier one 
tier two and even tier three suppliers because they want them to stay in business, they want them to scale up, and they want to be able to say, you know what, we help those businesses grow. When you think about what you do here in the great state of Nebraska and certainly Omaha, what is that program for supplier diversity? And how are we exposing them to the latest thinking? Something that Disney is doing is looking at partnering with suppliers even more as they think about their consumer base and certainly as the demographics of America changes, all right? So just a few more things as it relates to the business case. Without diverse leaders, women, people of color, and LBGT employees are less likely to have their ideas endorsed. Employees report experiencing trust and increased engagement at work when they feel included and perceive that their employer supports diversity practices. Here, let me just say this right now. One of the most challenging things that corporations have to be aware of is Glassdoor.com has become the place where people put their grievances about what they think about a culture. So this ability to, uh, if I'm a diverse candidate and I happen to separate from an organization, what am I feeling when I leave that organization? Right, wrong, indifferent, all right? And then um, if, you, if you're not familiar with the 400 and, uh, 450 CEOs of the world's leading companies have signed a written commitment to create workplaces that reflect these values. This is being led by Price Waterhouse Coopers. I would encourage you to Google and look at this. It's something very, very interesting to see that CEOs are waking up to the back that's like, hello, we have got to think differently in this time, all right? So seven ways to be a CBO. A CBO is a title that I have created that I believe diversity and inclusion needs to evolve to. So we have chief diversity officers. I believe that that real title should be chief breakthrough officer because what we want is breakthrough thinking. And if we get breakthrough thinking through diversity and inclusion, different perspectives, then we have the innovation. And I just don't wanna limit diversity and inclusion to it's either this or that. We all want breakthrough. We all want innovation. So the first thing it takes, the CEO commitment. When a CEO is committed to having the breakthrough in the organization, it's not just the words that he or she says from the CEO suite, it's their behavior, it's their communication, and people believe and authentically know that this organization uh, really values them. And then having champions, champions throughout a culture who champion what the CEO is saying, and it's not flavor of the month, it's not the program of the quarter, it's a way of life. It's embedding the chip where everybody gets it. And then accountability. So, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about the scorecard. It's that accountability, who wakes up every single day and their feet is being held to the fire as it relates to getting to the breakthrough. And then sometimes where diversity and inclusion fall down is because it's inconsistent. We started uh, for a few months, something happened in the paper, or we hear something about a competitor or something about a corporation, and then there's this mad dash to say, oh my goodness, we gotta do something. And it's the consistency over time, 24-7, 365, that creates the stickiness of diversity and inclusion. Certainly, I've already talked about being a sponsor inspect what you expect. So if we say we're going to be a diverse and inclusive, inclusive culture, what does that look like? And who has their eyes and ears to the ground to find out what's happening real time? And then certainly uh, this whole thing of being curious. And so I was with the folks at Google uh, not too long ago, and Google has decided that they will no longer hire the top 1% of college graduating seniors. They want men and women that they have that have what Google calls intellectual curiosity. Intellectual curiosity is I can come to the table with my diverse perspective and because I am a learner, I know how to engage the brilliance around me. So this whole thing of intellectual curiosity, I believe that is probably the foundation of all successful diversity and inclusion, all right? So this is, uh, I, I thought, you know, hey, I'm coming to Omaha, I might as well, you know, end with this particular quote. <laughs> but uh, the Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett, was speaking to the Columbia uh, University 
uh, MBA class, uh, their commencement speech, and he made this, this powerful statement. And I think there's gotta be more voices where more people are speaking up, speaking out early and often to say, here's what we believe, all right? Now, I'm gonna stop here. I know I stand between you and the bar. Just kidding. Uh, I'm gonna stop here and turn this back over to Willie. I will be around for the rest of the day. Thank you so much.